Hi, this is Deepa Chopra, and uh, it's a great honor and privilege for me to be hosting today at uh, Deepak Home Base in New York, uh, my office, uh, right near Union Square. I'm hosting today a very special friend and colleague and collaborator, Dr. Menas Kafatos, who uh, co-wrote You Are the Universe with me. Uh, this book that uh, you've heard so much about and that you have supported. And um, today we are going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the material here in You Are the Universe Discovering Your Cosmic Self and Why It Matters. But I thought uh, today should be a bigger conversation between me and Dr. Kafatos on uh, possibly what is the reconciliation between science and spirituality. Can science and spirituality come together uh, for our collective awakening or our personal awakening into what we call reality? As you know, previously I had written a book with uh, Leonard Malodna, who's a Caltech physicist. After he had challenged me in a debate and we became friends and we wrote a book together called um, War of the World Views. But today, we're not going to talk about the War of the World Views, we're going to talk about the Peace of the World Views and the reconciliation between science and spirituality. So without wasting any time, I'm going to immediately ask uh, Menas Kafatos um, to join the conversation. First of all, thank you for joining me, Menas. Uh, thank you, Deepak, for inviting me. And um, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, we've done this several times. I think, I think today's uh, topic, the way you presented, is actually very much on target because um, through all these changes that are going on in the world, people are a little bit lost. Mm -hmm. They're looking at um, the spiritual, their own experience of spirituality. A lot of people have them. But then, because of their hesitant, and it's not just scientists, they're hesitant because they're being, they can be called names. They can say, oh, you're, you're off the deep end, et cetera, et cetera. So let's get right to the chase. So right. let's first right. talk about science, right. then we'll talk about spirituality. Right. And I'll do the questioning and you help me Sounds. Sounds with good. the answers, okay? Sounds good. So I would say that today, mm. science is the most effective uh, means of looking at the world, of understanding the world. Science is also <coughs> the most effective way of uh, creating technology. I mean, this way technology right. we're using right now to communicate with the world is a gift of science. Correct. But science is a methodology, a very precise methodology, based on theory, um, experiments. Experiments, observation, validation, falsification. Correct. Correct. So, um, with that today, uh, our current worldview is that, um, and please correct me because I'm not a scientist like you are, uh, and before we even but go you're, there. You're an MD and also. Yeah, an MD, science, but, but you, you know, Dr. Kafatos uh, got his PhD in physics from MIT. He's published hundreds of papers on everything from climate change to quantum mechanics. And uh, he's a professor of physics and something else at Chapman University com right com now. Computational physics. Computational physics. So we're talking to somebody who really looks at the world with a scientific lens. And right now we would say that this lens is looking at two things, the big picture, which we call cosmology, <coughs> and the little picture, and the little picture <laughs> which we call quantum mechanics. Sorry. Now, as I understand it, quantum mechanics is basically a mathematical way of looking at reality at a very micro level, right? Correct. And uh, it started at the atomic level, so called atomic. It level. started at the atomic level and then moved into the particle level, the wave particle Deeper. duality, Deeper. quantum vacuum, etc. So let me ask you just a few questions. Right now, nobody disagrees about 
um, the fact that quantum mechanics works. In fact, every technology, including this one, is dependent Absolutely. on some ways Absolutely. on quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics has some very counter-intuitive principles, like wave-particle duality, like uh, entanglement, Correct. the quantum vacuum, etc., non-locality, all of that. So let, let me ask you a few questions, sure. okay? And then we go from there. Sure. What is the quantum vacuum that uh, scientists talk about? So the quantum vacuum, I mean, it's a, the world vacuum itself has different meanings, but the quantum vacuum per se is the place of all open possibilities, okay? Uh, it contains uh, maximally, we believe maybe infinite, uh, um, amount of information, but in a potential form, because in fact the specific information that we view, it's in the everyday world. You know, for example, let's take this book, right? This book has um, letters, right? And uh, you're the universe, it has some structure, right? It has some, there is some information there. So when I don't have to explain what the universe is every time, we're going to say, you're the universe, most people say, oh, I think, okay, I understand. I think I understand what you're saying, but let's go deeper. So, so if I, if yeah. I may just... Absolutely. Claude Shannon, mm -hmm. who um, mm -hmm. talked about information, created information theory, Correct. his definition, or um, again, maybe not totally quoting him, but in general, uh, information is described as the resolution of uncertainty. Right. So once you make a measurement, you derive information. Is that fair enough? Yeah, it's fair enough. Um, if you don't have, <coughs> if you don't have structure, structure knowledge, which is guided by information, then you have what is known as chaos. Now, chaos is not necessarily bad, um, but you know, um, you have to manage chaos, or you have to understand what chaos does. And there is, of course, a branch of mathematics called chaos theory, which gets into that. But to, to make a long story short, um, what really happens with um, information is that it is structured knowledge. Which means, I think we talked about that a little bit in the new paper that they were writing, you and I and um, Ashok and Rasim are writing. It sort of brings up the issue of um, um, information for whom? <laughs> or, you know, what's the sake of information? And we are saying, scientists say, well, information is, again, structural knowledge. It requires, I believe, and you believe that too, an observer. Yet, in this, something that it ought to be self-evident or, you know, self-explanatory, people don't go there because they, they're afraid of the world consci consciousness. And they even are afraid of the world mind, but mind is a little bit more Western idea. Um, but certainly consciousness, it brings up, well, okay, conscious, conscious of something else. So what, is, what are we conscious of? Well, um, we're conscious of what we call the world. But as we said in this book, that in itself is an experience. Okay. Right. Coming back to our quantum vacuum. Correct. You say that this is a domain of, let's use the word existence, if we can, that which exists. Right. But in the quantum vacuum, there is infinite potential information. Um, this is a good question. We're not sure if it's infinite, but it's so vast that for all practical purposes, it's infinite. Okay, so let's say close to infinite, near infinite potential information that ultimately expresses itself in the world of space-time, energy, and matter. Correct. Would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. So and, a few, and a few other variables like spin and so but those are the main ones. Okay, so this quantum information, quantum vacuum, which has potential information, which is almost infinite in amount, right. manifests as our everyday world of space-time, energy, matter. Correct. This is the world we're experiencing right now. Correct. On the macro level. And I would add to what you just said, also separation. Also? Separation. Please explain. Well, because, truly speaking, if it's a quantum universe, 
the so-called wave function, which we're, is described in the book, we're not going to talk too much about that today. It gives you all the possible outcomes, but it is a wave-like. So people say wave, I mean, when we say wave, but you're thinking of sound waves, you're thinking of ocean waves. No, it's really waves of possibilities. So the observer is very much barred from the get-go with information. Okay. Waves of possibility. Right. And, you know, in my interactions with other scientists, physicists, I say, where is it contained? Where is this wave function contained? And they usually uh, respond by saying Hilbert space. Uh, is that fairly accurate? That's correct. Uh, people say Hilbert space, which of course is a mathematical structure, uh, it's a mathematical framework to look at um, the quantum way, the, the evolution of evolution the quantum system, uh, you know, the observation, so-called collapse of the wave function, etc., etc. So this is Hilbert space. It's a mathematical space. So it doesn't. This space doesn't have any location in space-time. No, no. Does the quantum vacuum have any location in space-time? No, it's uh, beyond, or if you like, it contains space-time, or it allows for the expression of space-time. So space-time exists as potential. Potential. In just like everything else exists. Just like everything else. But because of the, because we believe so much our own theories, I would say, um, our own uh, frameworks, we have taken now space and time as absolutely existing. But you are outside, saying outside of the observer. But you are saying at the source of all existence, space time only exists as a possibility. Exactly. As a potential. Okay. And in fact Heisenberg talked about potential as okay. the way to go forward. Okay. And now this is a very valid concept, right. the quantum vacuum. Right. How much energy is there in the quantum vacuum? <sighs> Huge. <laughs> well actually this is one of the biggest biggest problems in modern science and depends on your point of view. Some people say it's not a problem. I believe it's a huge problem and it's a huge embarrassment. Uh, that's my view. Um, this quantum vacuum, um, the tip of your finger, like this, let's say a cubic centimeter, just like this, right, contains one followed by 40 zeros of all the mass energy in the observable universe. So please listen to this very carefully. The tip of your finger, if that was the volume of your uh, of the quantum vacuum represented. Part of the quantum vacuum. Part of the quantum vacuum, the tip of your finger, a cubic centimeter, let's say. Correct. Has more potential mass energy than the entire visible universe. Not only more, but hugely more. Hugely more. One followed by 40 zeros is a number that we cannot or can hardly understand. So look around you and look at the space around you. And the space around you is actually has its source also Correct. in the quantum vacuum. And every cubic centimeter of the space has more mass energy, hugely more mass energy, than the entire visible universe. Exactly. So, so this is a big embarrassment. Yeah, but not to us. No, not to us. Not to us. Because we say that the invisible is where the action is. is. Where the action is. This, this is what and the, the invisible makes the visible. Exactly. Possible. This is what uh, John Archibald Wheeler said, a great physicist and cosmologist, protege of Einstein. He said, uh, you know, the physics that we're talking about is nothing compared to the physics of vacuum. He says, well, there's other physics. Is. Okay. It's not. <laughs> so this is where we are in science, right? Today. Yeah. We have a big now, mystery. Now, big mystery. you and I have submitted a paper for publication with a colleague of yours right. where we talk about something called the Heisenberg cut. cut. So please tell our, our wonderful friends, what do you mean by the Heisenberg so cut? So Heisenberg was, um, uh, we believe, the first one to come up with the term, and von Neumann, John von Neumann, who of course... Uh, put together, if you like, the, the epitome of the modern uh, quantum field theory, but uh, back uh, 100 years ago or so, in the 20s, um, 20s and 30s. Uh, so today we call it the um, Heisenberg von Neumann uh, cut. So what is a cut? The cut is a place where below it, and, and we have to understand that below it is not space-like, it's not space, but below it means in a, 
in a logical sense. Below it, uh, at the deeper level, if you like, you have um, you have the wave function. You have all the possibilities are there, uh, but they are in unmanifest form, invisible, invisible, and potentially to manifest. In fact, potentially. They can manifest infinite number of universes. If it's infinite, probably potentially the quantum vacuum can Potence. manifest as infinite universes. Exactly. Yeah, at least there's a mathematics to that. The right? mathematics allows that to happen. Okay. Okay. Whether it is true or not, that's another story. But I mean, actually, the fact that the, and this is another discussion, long discussion. The fact that the mathematics allows it actually is very interesting in itself because is is knowledge uh, ultimately any mathematics that we can come up with is does that manifest? In some form, some people do believe that. Yeah, some people do believe that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, if that's the case, then in fact you have an infinite number. So, of is, if I were to summarize the quantum vacuum, right. um, the uh, Heisenberg card, the Heisenberg it's card. that location, it's um, which arbitrary, where the invisible becomes the visible. Right? Yeah, it's arbitrary. Um, yeah, it's basically uh, what uh, Heisenberg and, uh, as I said, von Neumann said. Okay, below it, but again, below it's not, <laughs> no space, but more fundamental level, if you like. Um, you have um, entanglement. Uh, entanglement means everything is correlated with everything else. Everything is correlated with everything else. You have a, a cosmic, or if you like, a universal wave function, mm -hmm. which is actually an interesting concept because it says that the entire universe can be described as a universal wa wave function. Wave side. Wave function. And that the wave function contains space and time. Potentially. Potentially, yes. And in fact, you can sort of write it down. And that's actually what gives information, because in fact you can do it. It's very simple, and this is what, uh, this is of course what the uh, uh, rules of uh, quantum logic give you. You can potentially understand the structure of matter and energy by looking at this, um, you know, at this structureless uh, potentia that has the ability, quote unquote, and what does that mean? But has the propensity, Heisenberg will call it the propensity, to manifest everything. Okay? But this Heisenberg card can't be located anywhere. So, um, von Neumann, who was, I would say, is one of the great, uh, I mean, people attribute to him a lot, but actually I think it's even more than the people attribute to him. Uh, of course, the, the initial the creators of quantity was uh, Niels Bohr. Werner Heisenberg, and to a certain extent also Einstein, even though Einstein turned against it, and then to a certain extent they both also follow Einstein and turned against it. But to make a long story short, uh, von Neumann um, argued logically, and there was no, at the time, there was the, the uh, eye equipment or the, you know, the understanding how the eye operates was very primitive. But he said, he argued, or he so show that that cut is not at the retina, it's not at the lens, it's not at the retina, it's not at the, it's not at the um, nerve, optical nerve, and it's not at the brain itself, the brain itself behind, behind the eye. And he, he showed that in, uh, in, the in the book, famous book that's called Mathematical Formulas of Quantum Mechanics. He showed that, that uh, you know, um, you don't really find that cut. So he didn't go all the way, but that in, uh, that in itself is what actually we're saying in our paper that we're writing together. As soon as you say the cut is not anywhere, then it is everywhere. So the invisible becomes the visible everywhere. Everywhere. But it requires an observer. It requires an observer. It requires an observer. And the observer is consciousness. The observer is consciousness. So um, what... If, physicists, or a lot of physicists, but I would say now a little bit more openly, are willing to accept, maybe because also of our work on qualia, and other people's uh, qualia work, that perhaps this whole issue is made too complicated. Maybe it's simpler than that. So bottom line is, how does the, <laughs> how does the invisible world of possibilities manifest. manifest into the world of space-time, energy, information, and matter? Because a particle has units of mass and energy, but um, the vacuum has only potential mass Correct. and energy, Correct. right? Correct. So a wave doesn't have units of mass and energy.
because it's possibilities, right? But the so-called collapse of the wave or the reduction, sometimes people call it the reduction of the state vector, that's actually Hilbert space language. Mm -hmm. The reduction of the, of the Hilbert space uh, potential, uh, which uh, are described very nicely in, in mathematical formulas in terms of uh, probabilities and wave function, um, upon observation reduces itself to this world, to this world, which we call the classical world, which we call the classical world. But then a big problem arises, big problem, and that's in the crux of the matter. First of all, how does it arise? And when we say it collapses, collapses the wave function, um, and you get to see the book. We collapse it, and now you have the book, this book. What happens to the other possibilities? There are zillions of other books. They're not there. So this is what, again, Wheeler, um, who was a protege of um, Einstein, called the participatory universe. We participate. It's, uh, people generally have um, two ways to re react to that. Either they say it's the most profound statement, or they say it's the biggest <laughs> BS statement. Because what it is saying is without a conscious observer, the universe would remain unmanifest. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so that's where we are now. In the year 2000, early 2000, uh, sometime, I gave a TED talk after sure. Richard Dawkins had uh, given the talk, and it's very well known that uh, I think I remember I was that castigated, I remember castigated, and, and uh, you know ridiculed, and thrown to the lions, right? and thrown <laughs> to the lions. But in that talk, I said five things about this domain of reality, and I want to see whether you agree or not. Number one. It's all possibilities or infinite possibilities or near infinite possibilities. That's right. Number two, everything is correlated with everything else. Uh, right. Entanglement. Number three, unpredictability or uncertainty. Correct. Number four, and that's where it got controversial, is the creative source of the universe where we can say, it, if we want to avoid the word creative, we can say it's the source of the universe. Yes. Correct? And that includes our bodies, you know, because our bodies are part of the material world. Of course, right? of course. <coughs> and number five. five was it needs a conscious observer to um, basically turn the invisible into the visible. Those are the five things that I said for which I was castigated. So I would you agree with these five things? So I don't understand why you're castigated because exactly that's a Copenhagen point of view. Okay. And, okay. This is, and, and you have behind you the Copenhagen interpretation is still the gold standard. I mean, you have other interpretations, but the gold standard is still Copenhagen interpretation. It is. It still is. Everybody says, oh, does it do as well as the Copenhagen interpretation? If it doesn't, say, well, you know, we'll go back to the Copenhagen. Okay, so we got those five principles, right? Five principles. That's science. Now let's go to spirituality. That's right. right. Okay, because science is about looking at the world out there, measuring it, Scientific experiments have either to validate or to falsify. Okay. Correct. Science, though, still has its dogma that the universe of physical reality is observer independent. Exactly. That, uh, you know, the famous statement of Einstein was realist the moon would still be there if no one was looking at it. Or the tree makes a sound uh, when about is observing. Or does the tree make a sound? And of course, my friend Michael Shermer has ridiculed me for making that statement as well. But it's an authentic query that uh, the moon is a human experience in human consciousness. I don't think a crocodile has any idea what a moon is or an Maybe. insect. or A, a, a wolf probably does. A wolf, a wolf probably yeah, does. Yeah, because response. So still, you need a yeah. biological organism. You need the biological organism. The biological organism and the moon go together. And that's why in this book we call it, we call it the human universe. We don't really mean, and I need to emphasize this, we don't mean that the universe is homo sapiens universe. No, but the universe we experience but the is... the universe we experience is a homo sapiens. Homo is sapiens. a human universe, yes. yes. Okay. So it's so not, and again, it's a question, what is reality? And it comes down to that. What is reality? So now we come to spirituality. So right. as the science looks at the world, so-called objectively based on an observer-independent world which can neither be falsified nor validated. It's a theoretical construct. The observer-independent world oh, yeah, right. is a totally theoretical concept, right? That with no 
possibility of even validation or falsification. You can you can get you, you can get the observer out. You can't get the observer out. <laughs> and you say, well, okay, so take out the take out the human observers. Yes. Well, there, I mean, there are other observers. There are other observers, like uh, wolves, as you said, or dogs, or bats. Yeah, they, they have they their own experience. They have a different experience, experience of, the of the universe. Yeah. Okay. So we call their universe now Homo sapiens sapiens universe. We call them bad bad universe right there. Okay. Now coming to spirituality, right. which is not about the world, what's out there, but which about the who's looking. You know, spirituality asks who's looking. What is it that wants to know? Who's the observer? And basically, who wants to know? And so in the great spiritual right. traditions right. that you're familiar with, the right. Vedanta and Kashmir Shaivism, right. right. that ontological primitive, which is the fundamental source of the universe, ground, is, ground, of, everything. ground of everything, is consciousness. Correct. And if you look at consciousness, before the mind-body experience happens, as understood again in these great wisdom traditions, traditions. then that fundamental ground of our creation <coughs> is usually referred to as pure consciousness. Correct. Because pure consciousness is prior to any experience, right? Right. So again, when we look at Kashmir Shaivism, Vedanta, Vedanta, they say exactly the same thing. Consciousness is a field of all possibilities, Correct. number one. Number two, consciousness dwells in the realm of uncertainty. You cannot predict the next thought you have or the next experience you're going to have. Number three, consciousness is the source of intentionality, which does the measurement. Number four, consciousness not only has all possibilities, but they're entangled with each other. Right. For example, our sensory experiences of sensations, images, feelings, feelings. and thoughts, thoughts, they're all qualia entangled they're in a way. And, and what you call one may not be absolute because maybe a, maybe a sound is at some point maybe the same as light. In fact. Yeah, it's synesthesia. <laughs> exactly. So, and then uh, in the great traditions we also say that consciousness uh, requires intentionality in order to um, manifest into the visible world Correct. as a mind, body, universe. Correct. So, you know, if you look at the five principles we said about fundamental reality in physics and the five principles of consciousness, the field of all possibilities, unpredictability, intentionality, entanglement, quantum entanglement, but qualia entanglement, and finally, intention, which is the source of manifestation. Without the intention, consciousness remains either uh, unmanifest or just as potential form. Without the intention, you don't have knowledge. Without knowledge, you don't have action. It's not that they're prior to each other in terms of temporal sequence, but it is fundamentally the first thing is the in intention. If you don't have intention, we cannot have knowledge. Now, as soon as you have knowledge, you say knowledge, knowledge of what? Knowledge is something else. And the people get hung up on the, on the term itself, consciousness, because they say consciousness, scientium from Latin means knowledge. Con means with. So people say, oh, it really means knowledge of something with. No, we're talking about awareness, fundamental awareness. And it does manifest as consciousness, it mani mani manifests as mind. And you said spirituality. Actually, uh, people often poo poo the, what they were saying, and also, by the way, not just us, Eisenberg and Schrodinger, all these guys, the great guys, more um, um, for sure. Um, they were saying that, look, there is the possibility of something being known. If there's no possibility of something being known, then we live in a crazy universe. Okay, then everything is entangled and nothing is there. So the human experience is experience of disentangling the quantum possibilities into specific things. A book, Deepak Chopra, your glasses, my glasses. At some deep level, they are all one. So that fundamental deep level, which right. we can call universal consciousness, right. cosmic consciousness, is experiencing itself right this moment as this, this, the book, the iPhone, and all the people who are watching us exactly. are all contained in that exactly. consciousness. So consciousness, both the subject of experience and the object, and the object of experience. Yes. And that's how consciousness 
knows itself as all subjects and all, all objects. objects. Okay. Now you have said in your papers, and I uh, contributed to some of that thinking, is that therefore there is only one observer. That is something that, uh, uh, what's his name, Schrodinger also said, the consciousness right. cannot be divided. And blank, both blank, uh, blank, huh? blank and Schrodinger. Blank, blank, and that there's only one consciousness. Okay. You can't multiply it, you can't divide it. You can't divide. But minds are many. Right. The minds are innumerable. They are also species specific. You know, other animals have a mind. Obviously, they're different than human mind, but they have a mind. And but they are, the source is the same consciousness. Correct. So I've been thinking that what we call the body mind. See, this is where maybe we can solve the Copenhagen dilemma. What we call the body mind is not the observer, but a mode of observation. This is an instrument of observation. The observer is singular, but the behind. modes, yeah, behind, but the modes of observation are innumerable, almost infinite, and therefore the same reality appears as innumerable objects, but it's the same reality. Correct. One observer, one object of observation, innumerable modes of observing, resulting in the, what should we say, the dreamscape or the experience of multiplicity, but actually beneath that, oneness. So let's take that point because people o often say, well, uh, wait a second, you're not really, what are you saying here? You're saying that uh, the existence of the universe depends on, on a particular observer, uh, a human observer that happens to have eyes and ears. That clearly, that's, that cannot be the case because a lot of human beings don't have eyes or they're blind or whatever, and they, they pick up everything, you know. They're doing fine. Ba a bat is, uh, has no eyes, but it can fly around. So it has to be something more fundamental than that, and it is really the field of awareness, what, what we call observer. In fact, in, in this article that we're writing now, we avoid to define the observer. And it's on purpose, because once you try to define the observer, you don't, get, you don't get anywhere. It's there. The observer is infinite possibilities. Exactly. So the observer, it's like it's there, but it's not there because of the infinite possibilities. So you try to grab it. What? What? Uh, the singular or unique individual observer only happens at the level of manifestation. Exactly. So there is this infinite potential below, quote unquote, but it's not below here, underlying reality, which is constant. So before we actually conclude this, uh, I'm going to give a plug to our book, You Are the right. Universe, Discovering right. Your Cosmic Self and What It Matters. And here are some of the chapter headings in case you're interested. What came before the Big Bang? Why does the universe fit together so perfectly? Where did time come from? What is the universe made of? Is there a design in the universe? Is the quantum world linked to everyday life? Do we live in a conscious universe? How did life first begin? first begin? Does the brain create the mind? And then the second part of the book is the power of personal reality, where you really came from. And then there's an appendix, which is all about qualia science. And that's enough for me and may not to plug the book. But what we are going to end by saying is, why does it matter? You know, why does it matter? And go back to the the five kleshas that the Vedanta and other spiritual traditions talk about, that human beings have existential suffering because, number one, they don't know who they are. They confuse themselves with their body-mind when, in fact, they are that field of all possibilities. Yeah. Number two, they are grasping and clinging at experience which is transient, ephemeral, evanescent. You can't hold on to it because comes and goes. it comes and goes. Number three, therefore, um, uh, fear of impermanence. Number four, identifying with a false identity, ego. And number five, the fear of death. But if we bring these two worldviews together, then we'll see that these are all human constructs that are not based on a true understanding of reality. You and I are timeless beings that uh, manifest in space-time as a human experience, but our essential nature is beyond birth and death. Correct. And once we get that, then all the other dis are 
all the other precepts which I talked about as the causes of suffering, right. they kind of disappear. They disappear. The, the thing is, the reason they are there and we cling to them is because we are familiar with an external, so-called external reality, we identify with it, and then we become married to it, you know? We don't want... <laughs> it's, a, it's a marriage that you can't get out of because we say, well, you know, it's... We, get, uh, we identify with identify. the dreamscape. Exactly. You know, external reality. Wittgenstein, he said, we are asleep, uh, life is a dream, but once in a while we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. So what do we wake up to is that fundamental, fundamental. core reality, which is our essence, which we call spirit. So is it okay to call it spirit? It's okay to call it spirit. In fact, uh, it is fundamental spirit. Um, spirit, uh, the, word, the Greek word is pneuma, or pneuma, which means really the moving, moving spirit or the, the active spirit. Um, so we are uh, stuck with uh, duality concepts, um, yes or no, and of course this is quantum, the universe is quantum, so it does, it does have the duality fundamental there, the observer and the observed, but at some point the observer and the observed merge. All the information going to our brain through our senses, is that quantum information? It's quantum information. Now but we, we don't experience quantum information, we experience no, this world. No, we don't. In fact, now um, there are papers published in Nature and Science which are very important uh, scientific journals where people are saying, well, actually, um, you know, the, the collapse of the wave function in, in the light, in form of light, light uh, point of light, is happens to human eye. So actually, the human eye is a quantum detector. So then the question arises, which is a big mystery, if the fundamental hardware and software is quantum, how come we see this world the way we see it? So when I look at this book, I experience the color blue, right? Right. But what's coming to my eyes are colorless frequencies of electromagnetic energy, or what we call photons. Photons right. don't have color, right? Shrand just said uh, photons don't have color. Okay, photons don't have color. So it's an experience. And color, of course, gives shape and form. Without color, there's no shape and form. Right. The only difference between the book here and the table here is this cut here between color and shape and right. form, right? So all the information that's coming is quantum and yet we see this. So where does color exist? Does it exist in the physical world? Does it exist in the brain? Does it exist in the, the electrical impulse? I, I don't think color has a location. So von Neumann said, uh, he paraphrase it, what you're saying, he said, uh, where is the cut? He said, it's nowhere. Uh, basically, what you're saying is, where is, where is the transition from the quantum universe to something that looks like a book? This doesn't look to me like a so, This doesn't look to me like a quantum book, right? If it's a quantum book, you'll be able to see any, yeah, same, possibilities. You know, be all, even possibilities, but it's a very finite book, right? Space and time, color. So where is all that? This is nowhere. So now, my dear friends, if you get this wonderful conversation that we have enjoyed between each other, but if you totally get this conversation, you'll realize that when we said you are the universe, that was literal. It was not a metaphor. You as consciousness Correct. are the creator of what you call everyday reality. Right. Right. What could be better than that? And that you is not subject to birth and death. It's eternal, it's timeless, it's infinite is all possibilities. Mena, thank you very thank much you. for joining me. Thank you. And we thank you all for supporting us and for listening and for being there. Uh, we will have this video available on social media everywhere. And if you have enjoyed it, then spread the word and uh, show it to other people and uh, get them to participate in this conversation. There's nothing more important than this conversation between science and spirituality if we really want to create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. Minas, thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you. Cheers, guys.